So give me a yes, thumbs up, or thumbs down, no, that a neural network is only invented recently. That's right, right? So neural network has been um, invented, you know, in their 1950s and 60s, uh, but it's only recently we started using it at a very, you know, broad scale, and you know, looks like it can solve, you know, so many interesting problems. Okay, so today we're gonna basically introduce you about deep learning and neural networks. So to give you an example, right, of a deep learning neural network, this is basically a system of self-driving cars, and when you can, you know, see you you, you read it from the left hand side all the way to the right hand side. So on the left hand side, you have sensors. So these are, you know, camera, radar, LIDAR, GPS, and other sensors. And then the first module here, right, is perception. This perception module essentially extract features, right, things out of these signals. So for example, the traffic light detection and classification, right, object detection and tracking. These are actually, you know, just for perception. But once you have perception, you have to be able to make decisions and then make behavior changes. So this is essentially where you make decisions. So you have these behavior planning, you know, route planning, right, etc. And then finally, you would basically change the state of the vehicle, right, make a decision whether you want to go forward, press the gas pedal, or you want to turn left, turn right, right, maybe sign some signals, right. However, when you look at through this whole journey here, pretty much like the most important stuff right here. This is, you know, underneath everything here. I'm pretty sure maybe like, you know, like 90% is deep learning. Like for example, everything inside here, these are deep learning models, okay? Things are here, those are deep learning models as well. So why, for example, we can use deep learning for these seemingly, you know, drastic different stuff, right? Because here we look at traffic light classification, detection, we are using camera sensors. Right, camera uh, outputs. And then, you know, we're also using radar outputs. Once these things are detected, you know, they could be, you know, for example, in YOLO, right, we have, you know, different object ID where they are, right? And then those signals will be fed into prediction, for example, right? But when you look at inside this box here, it's also neural network. Isn't that remarkable? When you think about the input for this box versus for these guys, they're dramatically different. And yet, underneath them, it's still deep learning neural network. Yeah, I thought that's pretty remarkable. Yeah, so, you know, to visualize it, you know, so this could be, for example, you know, one of the, you know, several modules working together, you can detect different, you know, traffic signs, you know, you can detect, oh, that's a van, that's a vehicle, you know, there's even the little vehicle can detect it here, that's a person, right? But once you detect those things, you have to be able to know, you know, uh, should you proceed? Should you make a right turn? Right, and that depends on your route planning and everything else. And this formulation here, right? This formulation here uh, is actually, you know, I talked to you guys before about this. This is reinforced learning, right? It's basically, you know, you have this neural net, which is the center of everything, right? Take the signals, right? Take the signals from previous modules. So your previous modules would be like, you know, detect, you know, perception. At the end of the perception, the results of the perception is you have these average speed, number of vehicles, yada, yada, yada. It's basically all the information necessary extracted from the environment. You feed that into a neural network and this neural network, right? Uh, and will make, uh, make some decisions, okay? Make some decisions. And once you make some decisions, you take some actions, uh, this is a, uh, you know, this could be your wheel environment, right? Or this could be your simulator, but this is your wheel environment, for example. And the environment will give you back some reward, right? Give you back some reward. And the reward, you know, in this case would be like, yeah, I've been driving on the road and uh, there are no accidents, right? There are no accidents, okay? Do anybody know what, what this formulism, you know, between an agent and uh, the environment? interaction between those two. Do you guys know what this formulation uh, is coined? Reinforcement okay. learning. That's right. 
Actually, good job. Yes, this is reinforcement learning, right? Reinforcement learning is this interplay between the agent and uh, the environment. And the agent typically, right, is represented by a deep neural network. Later on, you know, if you're interested, you should learn more about it. You know, you can see this Q here. This Q here is basically the reward, right? The reward uh, for each action giving a state of the environment. This is really interesting stuff. I actually can rec recommend a few books for you if you're interested in learning about it. All right, so let's, let's get in, you know, into, into the depth a little bit to understand uh, what deep neural network actually is. Um, but before we do that, do people remember what, what, this, what this cell is called? Neuron. Neurons, okay, neurons. And so neurons, right, we have lots of them in our brain, right? And they are composed by these uh, dendrites, which are, you know, finger-like, if you like, uh, structures where, you know, uh, on the cell membrane, they have these things called the ion channels and they combine the neurotransmitter. And these neurotransmitters are chemical signals, right, coming from upstream and they can either, you know, excite or inhibit this neuron. But in any case, that will change basically the action difference, the potential difference across the cell membrane. And once, you know, that potential difference change to like, certain threshold, then what happens is it will trigger a sequential opening and closing of these ion channels, right? And that's essentially the signal of action potential propagating, propagating through this axon fiber, okay? This axon fiber. And it's also pretty, you know, important for these axon fiber to be insulated, which is why you can see these are yellow cells here, right? These are mining sheets where they're insulating this action potential propagating through, sort of like, you know, you have the shell of a cable, you know, to protect the, the signal. Once you get to the end, so inside these guys here, there are these little vesicles. So there are little, these vesicles, like lipid vesicles. And these vesicles inside of them have these neurotransmitters. But once, you know, the signal here changed the potential difference between the cell membrane, these vesicles, then they would fuse with the cell membrane. And that essentially will release the neurotransmitters downstream here. And these neurotransmitters will in turn, right, excite or basically inhibit neurons downstream. How many neurons each neuron can talk to or bind to? Is it 100? We think it's more than 100. Okay, quite a few. We think it's more than 1,000. 1,000? Okay, still a few. We think it's more than 10,000. Okay, so each neuron can, can connect up to 10,000 other neurons. And we have 86 billion of them. How many people we have on Earth, planet Earth? So you imagine we have 10 times of the population of the entire planet. And uh, each one of us are connected to 10,000 others. 10,000. Right? You can talk to 10,000 simultaneously. And you have 40 different languages, right? Because the number of transistors, neurotransmitters we have is more than 40. All right. So that's pretty big network if you can visualize it. Okay, so neural networks, they work in networks, obviously. So this is essentially, uh, we're looking at the primary visual cortex in the back of our brain. And we did discover these things, they are basically organized you know, in layers. And in each layer, right, they function similarly. Let's take a look at how we actually discovered these neurons that are organized by layers. Won't. This is actually using cats to do experiments and in the 1950s and 60s. Actually listened in to individual nerve cells firing in the anesthetized cat as they presented it with different visual images. When we started working, Torsten and I, in the late 50s, we set up our first experiments and they didn't go well because at the beginning we couldn't make the cells fire at all. We'd shine lights all over the screen and nothing seemed to work. And rather by accident, one day, we were shining small spots, either white spots or black spots, onto the screen. And we found that the black dot seemed to be working in a way that at first we couldn't understand until we found that it was the process of slipping the piece of glass into the projector, which swept a line, a very faint, precise, narrow line across the retina and every time we did that we'd get a response that's the first video okay
okay, so this, this is essentially the visual field, right? For a cat, for, you know, his retina. And the sound, the popping sound you're hearing is essentially, you know, like basically they inserted one electro into the cat primary visual cortex, like one of the layers. And so each popping sound is basically one action potential that has been fired, right? You will see basically in the, um, in, in the brain, the more intense the signal is, the more frequent or more intense the firing is gonna be, okay, for action potential. see when the light bar was scanned in a different direction did the cell fire or not no right it didn't fire right so it's only looking at what looking at in one specific location in one direction isn't that remarkable so this video is pretty long so we're not gonna watch the whole thing so if we have basically you know if this is the whole visual field right if this is the whole visual field um, and you can basically see a line like that. What is, what is so useful about this organization? Why does brain do this? Is it to like detect like outlines of certain things? Yeah, exactly. It's detecting outlines of certain things. Because if you have one neuron that looks like this, you know, look at, you know, watch out for you, you know, for this, you know, edge, maybe have another, you know, that, you know, then, then you could have many of these different outlines, you know, different orientations all over the place, right? Doesn't matter, you can all just do that, right? So let's say you have all these, you know, basically neurons, they're doing all kinds of different things, then why is that useful? Well, then maybe, right? Maybe, just maybe, then, you know, you got, you got this neuron firing, 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 right? And maybe what you can have, you can see here's a face, <laughs> right? It's my crude kind of drawing that illustrates the idea that you basically, right? When you think about it, if you have a neuron, right? A set of neurons responsible for different, you know, outlines and contours. And if you can see a, maybe a, a pattern of them, right? Some of them that are firing, then you would be like, oh, you know, that will represent a face. And later you will see how neural network works. It literally is doing something very similar. It's combining these lower kind of features, lower features, right, to do interesting stuff. So neural networks, you know, they're organized by these layers of neurons, right? They're organized by these layers of neurons. And, you know, each layer we have these neurons. And as I said, these neurons, they have these values they do some count, count computation. You know, when you look at the input layer, so these are, you know, we presumably, we give the input layer some values, right? 
So in the case of YOLO, right, in the case of object detection, what would be your input? Your input would be the test objects. Yes, your input would be actually images, right? Because you're putting images into this whole network. So the input is actually pixel numbers. And when you think about this input, right, like different applications can take different inputs. As I mentioned, the, you know, the self-driving car case, right, if you take inputs from the camera, yeah, those are pixel numbers, right? But if you're taking inputs from, let's say, you know, maybe from the object detection or maybe from, you know, different routes, you had to plan different routes, then this input could be, you know, for example, maybe it's like, you know, this is a one, maybe represent, you know, like a pedestrian or a car, right? Maybe that's two. And then you, maybe you have X, Y, and Z, like where this position is, and maybe have velocity, right? Those are just input numbers put in here. But as I said, neurons, they also do a little bit of computation. And the way they do it, which we're gonna illustrate in the next slide, which is basically you see these arrows, right? These arrows. These are arrows, they're called weights, right? They're basically signifying how strong the connection is between each neuron, okay? So even though these arrows, you know, drawn like you know, identical here, but uh, their values, they're, they're not identical. So in this case, when we get to point two, the way we do it is we take the value of, the, of this neuron, multiply by, you know, this connection strength between this neuron and that neuron, plus this neuron, right, times this connection strength, plus this neuron times the connection strength. And then we would get a number and then we have to pass through an activation function, right? To give you this number. And this is essentially how real neuron actually process information as well, right? They are basically taking inputs from various neurons, right? They're taking inputs from various neurons. These connection strengths are different. And the connection strength, right? In a neuron kind of case, there are synapses, right? So synapses are Essentially, two neurons they come in together like this, and then you know in between, you know one neuron will release these vesicles containing these neurotransmitters, and the other one they're gonna have to have the right receptor, the receptors, yes, to bind uh, the neurotransmitters and to are opening the iron channels, right? But if you don't have that type of you know receptors, then you won't be able to open it. And the more you have, of course, the most the stronger you are. So that's essentially you know how a artificial neural network, right, took tips from the natural one, right, and we constructed things like this. Just to summarize this again, right, so, um, you know, we're looking at a single neuron here, right, a single neuron here, and let's just say in this case, we only have two inputs, x1 and x2, and these are different weights, w1, w2. Sometimes we also add a bias term, but this bias term, we usually don't do it. And so when you look at inside here, we look at inside here, that's exactly what I talked about, right? You have weights one times input one plus weights two times input two plus the bias term, right? And the output of the neuron, output of the neuron, which is y here, right, is equal to this function here and take these values. And this function, right, we call that activation function. So you might be like, what is a activation function? But this is basically, you know, we rewrite the whole thing in a vector form. You, you remember the math for AI lecture, right? We learned about matrices. And this is, you know, you have the weight vector times the input vector plus the bias vector and give you the output. So once you write down in a you know, vectorized form, right, it's very clean. So activation function. So sigmoid function is, you know, one of the activation functions. And what it can do is basically, so this is, this would be, so this, this right here, this axis right here. What, what do you think this axis is? The, the X axis, they're what? They're, they're weights, right? Times inputs plus buyers. That's this term right here. Here, what we have is essentially the output of a neuron. So you can see here, doesn't really matter what's the, um, what's the previous, uh, neuron is going to give it to us, right? It doesn't really matter. You know, it could be, you know, really, really big number, really, really big number right here. And the output in this case, if you have the input to be really big, what's the output is going to be? One. Yep. 
that's one. And if you have very small, very small inputs, then your output would be zero. So the sigmoid function, the sigmoid function, basically we strain your output between zero and one. We have also, in reality, we have these function called ReLU. We use them a lot. And the reason for that is because later on you will see, ReLU has very nice properties, especially in the training of a neural network. It tends to converge better. Um, so again, here we're doing similar things, but you know, when you have input, right, which are you know, weights times inputs plus the bias term, uh, if that value is negative, the output is just zero. But if, for example, the output right, is positive, it's just equal to the, to the input. So let's look at a few problems, right? So just to make it concrete. So one of the things that we're going to do, you know, during a hands-on kind of, you're going to build your own neural network, is we wanted to build this neural network to be able to classify different images that are handwritten digits. So, you know, when you look at it here, right, these are essentially handwritten digits. You know, for a human, you know, would it be pretty easy? For us, it would be pretty easy. But for a computer uh, algorithm or for a computer to do this, it's actually pretty hard, right? Because, you know, if you would imagine, if you want to make a, a rule-based system, you know, maybe it's like, you know, like you're looking at, remember computers, they see pixels. How do you actually tell this is zero? Maybe it's like, I don't know, maybe it's like you have everything connected, you know, maybe you can form a circle, but what's a circle, you know? Uh, it's gonna be pretty hard for a computer to do this until the neural network come up. So we're gonna essentially build our, new, our own neural network to be able to classify, right? Be able to classify each of these small images that has one handwritten digits on top of it, right? What that digit actually is. And you will see that that problem uh, sort of like is a solved problem. It's pretty easy to do. There are also, you know, things like this where the input is a text, right? So this is, you know, I think you guys probably heard about Andy, right? From today's title, talk about natural language processing, right? Natural language processing. So in this case, in this case, we have text and then we have to basically you know, turn these reviews, right? Turn these reviews of a movie to maybe to some sentiments, right? To classify whether this is a, you know, a good review or it's like, you know, negative review, right? Positive review versus negative review. But let me, let me ask you this question. As I said, neural network can only take numbers, right? Can only take numbers. Can't take, you know, pixels or text, you know, for, for images, we can turn them into pixels and we take the pixel values and we can feed that into neural network. But what about this review? What about this text information? What can we do to turn this into a number? You can have a list of like positive words and a list of negative words and whichever review has like more positive words is an overall positive review. Yeah, so that's, that would be, yeah, that, that, that would be an interesting way to do it. But my question, right, my question is, let's just say we're going to use a neural network to solve this problem, right? And my question is, uh, we know the input of neural network has to be a number. So my question is, how do we turn these textual information into numbers? Can you use an ASCII table? Uh, what's ASCII table? Um, it's like you correlate each letter or each phrase with like a number. Here we go, man. That's right. That's right. These are called tokens, right? So it's basically you have a giant dictionary, right? You have a giant dictionary, maybe a few thousand words, right? And so each word would represent by a number. That's it, right? And you rely on the neural network to make sense of how each of these words they're associated with one another. All right, so let's go back to recognizing the handwritten digits, right? So these are the input layer. So you can see here, this is a 28 pixel by 28 pixel kind of picture, right? And the input layer here, of course, were labeled, right? Were labeled. So someone has gone through the trouble to label all the images. So each image is a matrix of numbers and the matrix is then transformed into a vector for the neural network input. So in this case, we're just gonna stretch it, right? We're gonna stretch it, 28 by 28. We're gonna stretch it. And so the input, right, is the handwritten digits. The weights 
are just right enough so that the output here, the output here can essentially output the right digits. So for example, the 3728 here, right, will give you output, these images will give you output as 3728. So the important thing here, as you can see here, are these weights. So they have to be right enough. So you put in whatever pixels into here and you will come up with the right number. Do you guys know what the output layer looks like? How many, how many output neurons do you think we have? Maybe like one less than the input layer. Uh, why? Um, because like the example shows that from with three input layers out came two in output layers. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that the different input layers, there's always going to be two output layers coming out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right. But th this image here is just only for illustration purposes. Depending on each problem, then the output layer may have different number of neurons. Let, let me ask you, how many digits we're trying to detect? 10 digits, right? Zero, one, two, three, four, five. You got the idea all the way to nine. So then, you know, the output of these neurons, they're pretty simple. So for this neuron, it could be, you know, 0.2. But this neuron could be, I don't know, could be point, you know, 0.9, okay, 0.9. And for this neuron, could it be, you know, 0.1? And the way that whole, this whole thing is going to work is basically you just pick up, you just say this neuron, this whole network can make a decision. I just pick up the highest value and I'll say that, oh yeah, the output is one. So the neural network do, do, doesn't really recognize these patterns, right? They're basically just taking this input and translate that to an output. And each one of them will represent basically one digit. One of the things, as I said, the most important things is are these weights, right? These weights because these weights, they completely determine how a neural network would function. And we call them the hyperparameters. We call them the hyperparameters. And the way to really find out these numbers, right, is the most crucial thing. And when you think about it, in the 1950s or 60s, we have already invented a neural network, right? We sort of like discovered it, but it was not until maybe 2012 or 2013 until you know, just a few years ago, uh, we had um, you know, really a revolution usage of neural network. And the reason for that is really because we had uh, no way to really, quote unquote, train these weights, right? We don't know how to get them until we figure out now, okay? There are also other reasons, such as we had a more computational horsepower, we had a more data, right? But that algorithm, Right, the back propagation algorithm is the reason why we can optimize these weights. All right, so here's a, a confusing concept. So first of all, right, once you have these inputs here, so these could be you know pixel numbers. Right? So you got you got essentially like like images right here, and then here you have your predictions, right? Predictions. Um, so when you think about you know that propagation signal, it's literally right. It's literally Going from going from the images all the way to predictions. All your neural network is doing, right, is basically just calculating things. Just calculating things. You're not doing anything special. You're just calculating things to do, and these are called forward propagation. Forward propagation. And once you get your predictions, right, what happens is remember all these examples like handwritten digits. You have you have the truth, right? You do have the truth, right? You have the truth, you know, that's already labeled. You guys all labeled images, so you have the truth. So between the truth and predictions, right? Between the truth and predictions, right? Truth minus predictions, you can essentially get the loss. That is how wrong the prediction is. Once you get the loss, what happens is you can use the loss to see, you know, basically I know, you know, maybe this neuron should be, you know, like really high number, this neuron should be really low number, and I got something wrong. Then what happens is you can adjust, right? You can adjust these weights, or you can adjust the value of these guys in order for you to make these values right. But in order for you to, you know, adjust the value of these guys, you have to go and adjust the value of these guys. If you want to adjust these value of these guys, you have to come back over there here. So in the training process, you're actually going backwards, okay? So forward propagation for you to do the prediction and training, you actually have to go backwards. 
and you have to go backwards. So this training process is called a back propagation algorithm. And uh, we will talk more about that tomorrow. So just to illustrate that idea again, right? So you propagate forward. So this image is pretty busy now. You propagate forward, right? And then the difference right, between your predicted value when you want to do the forward propagation and the difference is coming from your calculated results and the labeled results, right? You call that loss, you call that loss. And then you use this loss to optimize these weights. So that's called a back propagation. That's how we train the neural network. It's very computationally intensive, which is why you're using GPUs to do that. So one of the things we need to talk about is this concept called a convolutional neural network. So everything we've talked about so far, they're fully connected layer, right? Fully connected. That is every single neuron, right? Like this neuron here is connected to every other neuron before it and also every other neuron after it, right? You can see that. This neuron connected to all the three inputs. This neuron also connected to all the output neurons. So these neurons, right, they are fully connected. One of the problems of a fully connected neural network is that there are just way too many, like these hyperparameters, because every single neuron is connected to every single other neurons. One of the things we also have to take advantage of a picture is that the pixels, you know, they are sort of like, you know, they have relationships among, among them, right? That is, there are correlations, right, for pixels that are close together. You know, people invent this algorithm, right, called a convolutional neural networks. And essentially what they do is they do convolution. So what is convolution? Well, so you focus on this, you know, source pixel. So this could be your, you know, 28 by 28, you know, pixels. Right, or you know, training by training pixels or for that input image. And then you apply a filter. Okay, you apply a filter. In this case, right, the filter is like you know, three by three filter, right? Size three by three filter. And so what you do is you take this filter, right? You map it to this image right here. Remember, this is three by three, you know, filter. So you map to that three by three pixels. Right? And all you do is you take the value of the pixel, multiply this filter value. You basically take each pixel and you add them together. Right? So when you look at this you know, simple calculation here, it's basically take minus one, minus one, right? times three, right? plus zero times zero, plus one times one, and you go to the second row. You see it? Right? It's basically mapping these things together. At the end, you get a one number. Right? You get a one number. So you got this number right here. And then here's another concept called a stride, which is basically how many pixels you move, right? How many pixels you move for each of these convolutional. So if stride is equal to one, then you move one pixel over. So the next calculation is centered around this little image here, that's stride one. And the next one would be this image right here, okay? So you're moving, right? one pixel at a time. So that's called a stride. The image classification algorithm that we're gonna apply is essentially gonna take 28 by 28 pixel image. And you can see here, we're doing a convolution. And we're doing convolution. And we're doing basically padding equal to one, kernel equal to three by three. So kernel is the filter. And stride equal to one. Okay, stride equal to one. And ReLU here, is essentially the activation function. So what it does is basically take these little filters and mapping from pixel to pixel, pixel to pixel, pixel to pixel, right? Until you have an image like this. And the reason why we have so many, a stack of them is because there are 32 filters, 32 filters. So you can imagine each filter does a little bit different thing. And then here, oh, look, we do a max pulling, max pulling, max pulling, very simple, very similar to the filters but you just take the max value out of it, right? You take the max value out of it. Now the stride equal to two, stride equal to two, kernel is two. And that would reduce the 28 by 28 to 14 by 14, right? Because you got a 28 by 28 now, each time you take two by two, right? And you each time you just move completely over because stride equal to two. So you basically have 28 divided by two, you got a 14 by 14 right here. 
right? 14 by 14 right here. And because there are 32 of these stacks, you take the max pooling. That's why this is 32 by 14 by 14. And then you do it again, another convolution, you get these numbers, and then another max pooling you get over here. What's really interesting here, this is very similar to our brain works, how our brain works. This is you're trying to extract features from this image. Remember what a feature was? When we look at the COVID-19 cases, we talked about people's social economical conditions, education, unemployment. These are features we think that it can correlate with the output that we wanted to predict, right? These are features. What's happening here is exactly the same, although you don't have to hand code any features anymore. The neural network will extract those features for you through this convolutional neural network through the training process. Once you extract these features, right? So I'm actually, let me just put it here. So this is extracting features. And here you're basically combining, combining features to make predictions. So here in the fully connected network, fully connected network is very uh, useful. We want to combine things together because they're just highly nonlinear and everything is interconnected. So you just basically use those features and based on those features, you can predict, oh, that's a zero, that's a one, that's nine. How many neurons are here again? We have 10 neurons because there are 10 digits we need to predict. So we learned about what is deep neural network, but how does it work? So again, right, in the machine learning case, like what we had in the COVID-19 cases, the input would be, you know, for example, COVID-19 infection, you know, infection rates could be, you know, for example, like people's education, income, you know, yada, yada, yada. What do we did actually, we did a feature extraction. We extract those features manually, right, by hand. And then we did a classification, right? We did a classification. And we said, you know, this, you know, is a car or not a car, or, you know, this is badly hurt or not badly hurt, right? That's traditional machine learning, traditional machine learning. This feature extraction part can take years and take a long time to get it right. Deep learning turned that thing completely you know, upside down. And it basically combined the feature extraction and classification together in one neural network, right? In one neural network, and it can predict whether you had a car or not. And that's really what's special about it. Now let's visualize what's actually inside a deep neural network. One word of warning, that is the industry doesn't understand how this thing works. We only knew it works, but we don't know how, and we don't know how. So here we're trying to visualize a little bit inside deep neural network how each neurons are doing. Recent advances in neural networks have enabled computers to better see and understand the world. They can recognize school buses and zebras and can tell the difference between Maltese Terriers and Yorkshire Terriers. We now know what it takes to train these neural networks well, but we don't know so much about how they're actually computing their final answers. We developed this interactive deep visualization toolbox to shine light into these black boxes, showing what happens inside of neural nets. In the top left corner, we show the input to the network, which can be a still image or video from a webcam. These black squares in the middle show the activations on a single layer of a network, in this case, the popular deep neural network called AlexNet running in CAFE. By interacting with the network, we can see what some of the neurons are doing. For example, on this first layer, a unit in the center responds strongly to light to dark edges. Its neighbor, one neuron over, responds to edges in the opposite direction, dark to light. Using optimization, we can synthetically produce images that light up each neuron on this layer to see what each neuron is looking for. We can scroll through every layer in the network to see what it does, including convolution, pooling, and normalization layers. We can switch back and forth between showing the actual activations and showing images synthesized to produce high activation. By the time we get to the fifth convolutional layer, the features being computed represent abstract concepts. For example, this neuron seems to respond to faces. We can further investigate this neuron by showing a few different types of information. First, we can artificially create optimized images using... So one of the most interesting things here is he mentioned this thing in this neuron is actually about higher le level neuron. This is happening in the fifth layer, right? Fifth layer. It was actually combining the previous layer information and the previous layers could be, for example, just extracting these edges, right? But you're combining these edges and maybe that neuron is actually taking all these inputs and be able to say, that's a face. So it's only activated when certain neurons in the previous lower level neurons, when they are activated. 
using new regularization techniques that are described in our paper. These synthetic images show that this neuron fires in response to a face and shoulders. We can also plot the images from the training set that activate this neuron the most, as well as pixels from those images most responsible for the high activations, computed via the deconvolution technique. This feature responds to multiple faces in different locations. And by looking at the deconv, we can see that it would respond more strongly if we had even darker eyes and rosier lips. So the deconv is basically take, you know, whatever in that um, layer and you back doing the deconvolution of your neural network, right? So you, instead of you condense it down, you in the other direction to basically expand the whole thing so you can see these pictures. We can also confirm that it cares about the head and shoulders but ignores the arms and torso. We can even see that it fires to some extent for cat faces. Using backprop or decon, we can see that this unit depends most strongly on a couple units in the previous layer con 4 and on about a dozen or so in con 3. Now let's look at another neuron on this. So here is the one most powerful concept of why deep neural network works. It's using distributed composition, right? That is, it's not, for example, if an else statement, but you can see all these neurons, previous layers, all these guys, they somehow contribute to one single neuron that can see faces. But these neurons, they do nothing but just recon, you know, recognize different edges anyway. So you can basically combine them for something else later. Maybe you can use them to recognize, I don't know, maybe, maybe a car, maybe a horse. So these neurons, they can be combined in different way to give you higher order predictions. So what's this unit doing? From the top nine images, we might conclude that it fires for different types of clothing. But examining the synthetic images shows that it may be detecting not clothing per se, but wrinkles. In the live plot, we can see that it's activated by my shirt. And smoothing out half of my shirt causes that half of the activations to decrease. Finally, here's another interesting neuron. This one has learned to look for printed text in a variety of sizes, colors, and fonts. This is pretty cool, because we never asked the network to look for wrinkles or text or faces. The only labels we provided were at the very last layer, so the only reason the network learned features like text and faces in the middle was to support final decisions at that last layer. For example, the text detector may provide good evidence that a rectangle is in fact a book seen on edge, and detecting many books next to each other might be a good way of detecting a bookcase, which was one of the categories we trained the net to recognize. In this video, we've shown some of the features of the DeepViz toolbox and a few of the things we've learned by using it. You can download the toolbox of this URL and explore for yourself. If you, you know, I tried to get Jason to give us a guest lecture, but he ignored my email. Maybe he's in Nepal, but he was my actually housemate right across the dorm hall uh, back when I was undergrad. So pretty cool guy. I'll try to get him next time. Hopefully, you know, you learn a lot about deep neural network, you know, in this like short lecture. You know, we actually went all the way, right, from, you know, what a deep neural network is, uh, to its applications, to, you know, convolutional neural network, to how we actually going to train those guys. And then to, for example, the couple of uh, very interesting ideas of why deep neural network works, right? And why it's actually, you know, the future of machine learning.